once and once and very good times. In Scotland there lived, and they never heard they died, seven men, they were all called Jimmy, and they stole a wee boat. They stole the boat, for they were prey to a terrible affliction, which deprived them of their health and vigour whenever hard labour was mentioned. There was a watchdog on the boat they stole. They tied him up and called him Rover. And they cast off from the quays in a squall of August rain and set sail for the islands that are scattered about the oceans towards the ends of this world. The first place they came to, they came to on the top of a wave, and that landed them on the top of a rock, and that took out the bottom of the boat, and that was them at the foot of a cliff near an old shambles of a castle. They hauled themselves ashore and wrung themselves out, slithering and splathering through the tangles of the kelp and the dulse and the bladder rack and the other seaweeds, and up the steep path to the castle they went, the seven men called Jimmy, and the dog Rover, and the first man there banged on the door. <coughs> The door creaked open, and the owner of the place peered out. A splinter of a man with lank grey hair, a drip on his nose end, and an endless chatter in his teeth. Oh, I never buy at the door. So you can just take yourselves away from here, whatever you are selling. We have been shipwrecked here, and be knighted on the shore, said Jimmy. Aye, so we have said Jimmy. Hey, and we've come to dinner, said Jimmy. Hey, and we're staying till we fixed our boat, said Jimmy. Hey, and we'd like a drink, said Jimmy. What's your name, pal, said Jimmy. The seventh Jimmy said nothing. I am the laird of Offy Draft Keep. I'm not made of money to be asking than every passerby that comes chapping at the door. I was just going to bed myself. Take yourselves off out of here. And he tried to close the door. But Jimmy had his foot in it. Hoot shit, surely, yet. Porridge'll be fine, we're no particular. Oh, tart he's in here, and where's the ladder, said Jimmy. Here's a barrel, said Jimmy. Knock her in, said Jimmy. I seen it first, said Jimmy. The flabbergasted laird was elbowed aside as a seven rogues made off in all directions amongst the teetering stones of his dwelling place. There was only one room, really not counting the outhouse privy. The rest was all knocked down by Oliver Cromwell. What a man for gravity. Crivens, it's freezing in here, said Jimmy. No wonder it's called off a draught. Do you no get rheumatics? Hack up with a table, said Jimmy. Let's get a fire going. Yon old press door had burn great, wouldn't it? No, said Jimmy. Aye, said Jimmy. Where's my matches? Soon they had a grand blaze started in the grate and made themselves warm and comfy. Not to put too fine a point on it, they ate every bite of food in the place. They drank every drop of drink. They stripped the lead off the roof and bundled it down to the village to sell it for more. And by the time they left, they left the laird poorer than a church mouse. They left him ruined entirely and they left the dog, Rover, behind. The laird of Offy Draft looked at the dog. The dog looked back at him, wagged its tail, and farted. A tail like a bandaged thumb, a fart like rotting whale guts, a scrap of a dog. If all the dogs in the world were one together, what was left over was Rover. With a sharp exhalation of breath, the laird turned and speedily made for the outer air and the steadily falling rain. He thought he'd go to the village post office and write his cousin for a loan. It was worth a try. He also planned to advertise for summer guests and bed and breakfast. Rover followed after him with dignity and flatulence. As they were coming home again, over the mountainside, Rover suddenly sped away across the heather with yelps of glee and a turn of speed surprising in one so short. He was an excellent ratter. But never having been long off a boat before, for his money the ginger beastie he was chasing was the biggest rat ever seen. The fox, though, in no way disconcerted by the dog's pursuit, doubled back in a wide circle, came fleeing full tilt towards the laird, and leapt into his arms. There was an abrupt, frizzling sound. 
the fox turned into a lean, red-haired woman, most fashionably attired. Rover was baffled. So was the laird. The woman put an arm about the laird's shoulder and said coyly, Hmm, call off the doggy, there's a dear. The laird of Offy Draft put the woman down and stepped back with traditional Scottish embarrassment. He was not accustomed to the company of women and certainly not to such precipitate cuddles. My name is Renardina, said the stranger, tossing back her strawberry ringlets. I understand you have some rooms to let, dear. Being engaged at this present in a sequence of magical operations, I require a nice, quiet castle with prospect of the sea. Oh, hey, well, as a matter of fact, I do just have one or two vacancies left, said the laird, hardly able to believe his luck, and he lost no time in conducting her over the hills to Offy Draft. But when he came within sight of the place, he could scarcely believe his eyes. For what he had left but an hour or so before, bare, roofless, ruined and cheerless, was now thatched with goose down which sparkled like moonlight in the steadily falling rain, and the windows were glazed and curtained, and within all was warmth and comfort with easy chairs and pictures of stags at bay and rabbits at bay and firelight twinkling on beautiful suits of armour made in Japan. At the back of the hall, thickly carpeted stairs led up where no stairs had led before, to richly appointed rooms where no rooms had been before, and it was there that Renardina planned to settle. I do hope you like the improvements I've made, dear. Demon decorating just isn't what it used to be, but it'll have to do. I'll be sending for the rest of my luggage in the morning, so you'll be helping with that, won't you, dear? And I like to keep myself to myself, dear, so I won't be seeing much off you, will I? Night, night. The following day, by the first light of day, her luggage began to arrive by the cartloads and the basketfuls. The place had never seen such comings and goings. And amongst the teams of wagoners and cadgers and carriers and porters and delivery boys came pigs with wheelbarrows and singing telegram services and spotty children on donkeys that had strayed from the promenade that rainy morning. And amidst all these, in a carriage drawn by singing birds, there came reclining a most beautiful young woman. Her hair was like the midnight, and her shoulders like the driven snow, and that was just the back of her. Fiona, my darling sister, squeaked Renardina, rushing out to meet her. Welcome, welcome to your new home. Fiona stretched out a well-turned ankle and stepped down from her carriage. She smiled and nodded, but made no reply. You must be so tired after your journey, said Renardina. Come inside and I'll make you a nice cup of tea. And taking Fiona's arm, she escorted her to her rooms above, where Fiona seated herself at once by the fire, took out wool and knitting needles and began feverishly to knit. Still and still never a word she spoke, and whatever it was she was knitting, the uncertainty of its outlines was equaled only by the unabashed fervour of its colour clashes. Oh, Fiona, said Renardina, I know you don't like not being able to talk, dear, but just put up with it a little while longer. It'll all be for the best, dear, you'll see. I can perform the invocations and spells this very night, dear, to summon up a perfectly splendid hero who will probably sort it all out in no time, dear. As a matter of fact, dear, the moon is in just the correct phase for hero summoning, dear, and the confluences of terrestrial magnetics are perfect in this old castle I've found, dear. What a stroke of good planning on my part. The following day... At the first light of day, there came a thunderous pounding at the door. Hang on, hang on, I'm coming, said the laird of Offy Draft, praying to God it wasn't the seven Jimmies back again. He peeked out of the letter box and reassured at least that it was not. Cautiously commenced the unbolting of the door. There in the courtyard was cavorting a huge highland hero, jingling at every motion with pounds of Celtic silverware and wearing a kilt that made the laird's eyes hurt. Hello, 
Mario, said the hero, lapsing out of the Gaelic. My name is Gordon Donald Roderick Murdoch Rory MacRory Moore, son of Rory of the Strange Moods, lord of the outermost rocks, and shepherd of the seals. He was twirling a six-foot broadsword in a nonchalant and highly dangerous manner as he spoke these words, with a morning drizzle dribbling from his shaggy shoulders and bedewing the fine thicknesses of his hog-wild chest hair. He made a fine figure of a Highland hero, though his cheery grin revealed a shortage of teeth, and his heavily bearded face betrayed no signs of any hidden wits. Am I in the right place at all? And is breakfast ready? said Rory, swaggering into the castle hall and striking a pose beside the fireplace to indicate readiness for a nibble. A dozen fried eggs were what he required right away, and it was one cauldron of porridge and a side of venison later he was introduced to the ladies. And when he saw Fiona... You could tell by the crossing of his eyes he was smitten madly with love. She is under enchantment, dear, and will remain unable to speak or return any affections till a hero and a t- I am your man, said Rory Moore. I haven't told you what the quest is yet, dear. You have no doubt heard of that class of wizards known as Gruagax, dear. Well, one of their number, the Gruagax Goira, or Laughing Wizard, has not been laughing in a great long while, dear, nor are his whereabouts susceptible to discovery, neither by magic mirror nor advertisement, dear. We don't know where he's gone. He must be found and brought here, where one cackle out of him will free Fiona from the spell she's under. And she'll be likely then to fall head over heels in love with the first man she sees, dear. Which could very well be you, couldn't it, dear? If I can be of any means of freeing this fair damsel from enchantment, or of winning a place in her affections, I am your man, said Rory Moore, using one of the permitted replies always spoken by heroes in this situation. Yes, well, very nice, dear. Now, if anyone could tell you how to proceed, it would be the Archdruid of all Scotland, who at this time of the year can be found gathering herbs on a hill in Edinburgh known as Arthur's Seat. Fiona then, with a most charming smile, gave Rory Moore what she had been knitting. It turned out to be a pair of kilt hose of the McRory Tartan, and this further inspired the hero so that he set off for Edinburgh without further delay. Rover went with him. When they got to Arthur's seat, they found the druid cannily gathering herbs in the steadily falling rain. Rory Moore at once began to recount the details of his quest using the time-honoured formalities and circumlocutions appropriate and customary in addressing a druid of high rank. But he had scarcely launched his first canto when the druid interrupted him by battering him viciously about the legs with his druid stick. Jesus, will you hold your horses? You'd think I was an ignoramus. Haven't I been waiting for you here since five o'clock in the morning? Now, you help me and I'll help you. Me pet rat, Raticus, of whom I'm very fond, has gone a-missing. And what's worse now, he's taken with him me red bonnet of rapidity, which I need to get about the price of petrol being what it is these days. I want you to bring him back to me. It'll be a help to me, it'll be a help to yourself. Now, further, I am greatly vexed by a golden bird that keeps flying into me back garden and flying away again with apples off me apple trees. Now I can make a bloody good drink out of them apples, but not if they're not there, you know. It's that wise woman of morning side. She's got that bird put on to me. She's one of these health food freaks. Convinced me apples have got rejuvenating properties. Get the bird away from her. It'll be a help to me. It'll be a help to yourself. And that's me final word on it. The druid's highly tuned senses now informed him it was opening time at the Bag of Nails, the tavern where all the Druids used to repair of an evening. So, Rory Moore and Rover the dog set off for Morningside through the steadily falling rain, and it was late in the evening when they got there. Not a light showed in the wise woman's tower. Stay, Rover, sit, sit, 
good dog, said Rory Moore. I'll climb in and get the bird. And he began to swarm up the ivy on the tower wall, hand over hand the way he'd learned in hero school, and stealthily smashing in a window with his boot, he clambered into a high turret room. There, in a rickety wooden cage, was perched the golden bird. Nearby stood a beautiful golden cage, quite empty. This golden cage was studded with porphyry, jacinth, chrysoprase, and lapis, and round the base was a band of precious metal inscribed with the wise woman's favourite motto. You are what you eat. Oh, it seems a shame to take the golden bird in that old wooden cage, thought Rory Moore. I'll take it in the golden one. He reached his ham of a hand into the wooden cage and took out the golden bird. But no sooner did the feet of the golden bird touch the perch in the golden cage than the cage gave out with screeches and yells and the sound of bells and guards appeared from all quarters by their tens and dozens with loaded blunderbusses pointed at the vitals of the Highland Marauder and they were about to commence kicking the seven daylights out of him when the wise woman herself appeared and bid them hold off. She was in her nighty terrible sight, and her face was buttered all over with an organic mud pack in which various twigs and roots were firmly embedded, and her iron-grey hair was twined up in pine-cone rollers, specially imported from Sweden, and she said, I'd normally have you hung for that, so I would, but luckily for you, I was needing to take on a hero to do a job for me at this time anyway, so I'll make a bargain with you. I'll spare your life if you'll bring me the white goat of Ochendine. Oh, I would do that with pleasure, madam, said Rory Moore. But you see, I must have the golden bird as part of the quest I'm on. Aye, well, uh-huh. The milk of the white goat of Ochendine makes a fabulous beauty bath, so it does. If you bring me the white goat, I'll let you have the golden bird. But you must bring me the white goat by first thing tomorrow night, or it'll be the worse for you. Guards, show him the door. And they showed him the door. Rory picked himself up and whistled for Rover, and they set off for Ochendine through the steadily falling rain. But it was a long, long way to Ochendini. Counting up on his fingers and wrinkling his brow, Rory estimated the journey it would take in the region of uh, a long time. As they were splashing across the raging torrent of a brook, Rory Moore was muttering to himself, Oh, dear, 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 dear me, Rover. Do you think we would ever get there and back in time at all? Damn if Rover didn't reply. Aye, lad, I can get you there a sight faster than this. Mechty me, you can talk, said Rory Moore. Why did you never talk before? Why? No one ever asked me anything, lad. Turn collar I'm wearing thrice round on me neck. I'll run you there about five and twenty past midnight. So Rory turned the collar three times round on Rover's neck, and he straddled the dog's back with his legs stuck out before him, and Rover lit out for Ochendini like a short, hairy rocket, leaving behind him an invisible cloud of pollution. Now the laird of Ochendini had made a terrible lot of money out of racehorses. But amongst all the stud stallions and pedigree mares he had in his stables, the place of honour he reserved for his white goat. The milk of this goat the laird exported in prettily labelled tins to the land of Egypt, where the queen had taken a fancy to the Ochendini beauty bath, and the money she was paying him for it was that ridiculous that the goat was worth more to him than all his other beasts put together, so he had the stables guarded, you see. I'll not belabour you with Rory Moore's belabouring of the stable guards. When he had the measure of them all laid out for the count, he knocked the stable door off its hinges with his shoulder and strode inside. There lay the white goat, contentedly chewing the cud on sweet straw. A fine, frisky wee animal, but not seemingly worth all the fuss and bother, you'd think. On the wall behind was hanging an old rope tether. Next to it, hung a beautiful golden tether.
Oh, that golden one will be the one to take, thought Rory Moore, always a man to learn by experience. But no sooner did he settle the gold tether about the neck of the white goat than a wee bauble at the end of the tether began to emit at piercing volume the sound of a bagpipe band playing Carry Me Back to Old Och and Dinny. At once guards came pouring from all quarters by their tens and dozens with loaded blunderbusses pointed at the vitals of the Highland Marauder, and they were about to commence kicking the seven daylights out of him when the Laird of Och and Dinny appeared himself and bade them hold off. He was naturally attired in a tweed dressing gown, tweed pyjamas, tweed nightcap and tweed slippers. He had a moustache the colour of gall wise tobacco and bloodshot peepers like salmon flies and he said, yeah, well, what have we got here? Well, he is here, Jaffy. Absolutely are. It's just not on this gallivanting about, filching a chap's valuable goat and waking a chap up in the middle of the night. I think you've got a damn nerve, old thing. You've got anything to say for yourself? Why have you taken out and hanged, drawn a quarter, quarter, drawn and hanged? I never remember a damn thing on first. Well, Rory at once began an explanation of his quest. He mentioned the wise woman of morning say and the arch druid of all Scotland, and he no sooner got to the part about the Grugach Goira than the Laird of Ochendini turned several shades of pink and white alternately, and in a voice quivering with emotion he exclaimed Gad That Grugach you mention is father of the gal I adore the charming Lucy. I wrote to her scarcely more than a year ago, and she has not replied. I, 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 I have not written again, and I, I did not wish to appear over forward, but I'm starting to worry about her somewhat. I had well, you might worry. She's probably in deadly danger. They always are in these stories, you know, said Rory Moore. Oh, but I could bring her here soon enough, but I must have the white goat as part of the quest I'm on. Quite. Well, I agree. We absolutely are. The sergeant here will, will tell you where to find the Grugo Chappie, won't you, sergeant? Hmm? What? What? And if Lucy's not here by tomorrow night, though, it'll be the worst for you, damn goat fever Chappie. Those of you who have heard stories of Grugachs before will know that their houses are normally composed of cheese, or their roofs are thatched with rashers of bacon, or their front gardens feature numerous iron spikes upon which the heads of king's sons are impaled. But the house of the Grugach Goyra resembled none of these. Famed and renowned in the breadth of the world for the near continuous laughter after which he was named, the Grugach Goyra had previously made an honest living, selling pictures of himself in mid-chortle or full guffaw. And these cheered folks up. So they sent him unsolicited testimonials and changed their minds from suicide and what not. So the Grugach's house resembled nothing so much as a gypsy caravan, on the roof of which was painted in bold letters, Goyr, and on one side in vivid reds and greens, sad hearts cheered, broken hearts mended, and on the other, hear him laugh like a jackanapes, laugh like a drain, hear him laugh like a laughing fool, roll up, roll up, roll up. But in the time of his sorrow, the Grugach had removed himself far from his usual haunts, and it was Rover's keen nose alone that enabled them to track the caravan's wheel ruts across leagues of mountain moor, and a bleak and rainy dawn was breaking as Rory knocked at the caravan door. A voice within groaned. What on earth do you want at this time of the morning? And Rory Moore began explaining how he had sought the Gruagach far and far to purge him of his gloom by grand heroics that his laugh might free Fiona from enchantment. And he told him the Laird of Ockendini had asked for his daughter Lucy's hand in marriage. And the Gruagach said, It is very true. I laugh no more. For mine is a sad, sad story. Come on then, lad, spit it out. We haven't got all day, said Rover with a small, cheerful fart. I was strolling with my daughter one August afternoon when the sun was nearly shining. We met McNab, the ogre. 
He had a dead stork under one arm. He invited us back to his cave for some boiled stork. But once we were seated upon the stone benches on either side of MacNab's fire, we found we could not rise from them again, and MacNab sat gnawing portions of stork and throwing the bones in our faces, which was pleasing to him for an hour or two. Then, muttering a magic rune, MacNab banished the spell that had entrapped Lucy upon his stone bench, and flinging her over his shoulder, he bore her off to a prison of concealment he has in the deeps of the earth below his cave. When he returned, he grasped me by the arms and by the legs, and ripped me from the stone by force, so the skin of my back was left behind, and he cast me out into the rain. All that I could do to heal my wounds was to clap an old black sheepskin over me. It has grown to become one with my own skin, and the clothes I wear are woven from the wool I shear from my own back, and I am as you see me now. The Gruagach stepped out from his caravan into the foggy and torrential daylight. Black sheep's wool grew from his back and shoulders. He wore a hat and breeches of the same material, and a sorrowful face the poor fellow had. Oh, the monster, said Rory Moore. No wonder the spark of laughter has departed from you, Grugach. But I will settle MacNab. And they set off for the ogre's cave, in the high seclusions of the mountains. Rory Moore, Rover the dog, and the Grugach Goira, all three. They got there in Olympic time. Christ, look at that for a door, said Rover. Barring all entry to MacNab's stronghold, three huge black wheels were spinning. These wheels were edged with sharp blades and spiked with deadly spikes that hissed the one against the other in their turning without relief. In the heart of each wheel was a scarlet mouth that dripped blood, and the first mouth said, Turn back! And the second said, Venture no further! And the third said, Pass! By. In the ground without there towered a pole of combat, to the tip of which a great many severed heads were tied, some fresh and gory, some mouldering in their last decay, and some but skulls. It was a hard man or a fool who could view them without a shudder. Grand, grand! I will challenge him to solo combat, roared Rory Moore, striking the pole of combat with a blow that rattled the heads upon it till they clattered like a cartload of bottles down a cobbled hill. The deadly wheels ground to a halt, and MacNab came out. He was a large ogre. When MacNab was feeling cheery, he could crack walnuts with his eyelids. But he was not cheery now. And in a voice that was not sweet, he inquired, Hee-ho, Hogarich, who are you that desires to die? They conducted the usual pre-battle incivilities in perfect textbook style, so it was less than half an hour till they began to fight. They made the hard ground soft, they made the soft ground hard, they made the high ground low, they made the low ground high, they made springs of water spurt from the solid rock and green rushes grow through the buckles of their shoes. The sweat and the blood of them was scattered here and yon like flocks of spring birds at the swoop of a hawk, but hard as MacNab swept battle beneath the tines of his beaked war club, he was finding Rory Moore, a hard man and to kill. Whilst they were thus engaged in grand heroics, the Gruagach Goire and Rover crept cautiously past them, between the wheels and the deadly blades, into the cave of MacNab. And in the back of the cave, worn steps led down into the deeper dark and the fundaments of the earth, where MacNab had his vaults of drink and his prison of concealment. Strike up a light, then, said Rover, and the Grogach lit a hooded lantern he had brought, and down they went. 
Now the dark way that wound to the prison of concealment was mazed and pitted with bottomless chasms and clefts of venomous serpents, and so on and so forth. But all this has been faithfully recounted in such European masterworks as Curse of MacNab, Son of MacNab, and MacNab Three. So if they got to the prison of concealment unscathed, it need be no greater matter for amazement that they found, hanging from a nail beside the prison door, a key marked, key, with which they lost no time in releasing Lucy from her confinement. She was a little pale after six months in total darkness, but still utterly charming. Oh, Daddy, I've been so bored. I'll be going home now. I have a laughing engagement at a wedding first, Lucy. Oh, Daddy, I love weddings. Can I come too? The Laird of Ochendini has asked for your hand in marriage. I say, what a lark. It was after the rescue that their troubles really began. For one bottomless chasm looks much like another, and before long they were hopelessly lost. The candle in the lantern began to sputter, and next to fade, and when it went out, the dark was darker than before, and there was a lot more of it. Feeling their way along the walls, they were each conscious of a state that might best be described as rising terror, and so, miles below the earth and in mortal danger, we leave them. <laughs> Meanwhile, above, the battle continued unabated. Rory Moore and MacNab had put wounds on each other you could see the daylight through, but neither was showing any signs of weakening. The song of Rory's broadsword was like the north wind, and the howl of MacNab's beaked war club like the thunder, and they fought on steadily in the steadily falling rain, and the beard grey clouds of evening were shouldering against the chins of the high hills. Meanwhile, miles deep in the lost dark below, the Gruagach and Lucy suddenly heard a gasp of a bark from Rover, and the dog said, Shh, shh, do you hear that? Hear yeah, what? What? That high voice, singing. Shh, there it is again. Some moments later, they could all hear it, faintly enough, and they made their way cautiously in the direction of that sound. Soon a pale bar of light could be seen in the distance, and that light was coming from under a door, and behind that door a voice was singing. My darling told me to leave after Faith, our my life would be over in a very short while. Get that door open, said Rover. I smell a rat. In the room, a tallow dip was burning with a feeble glow, and by its light they could see they were in one of MacNab's vast and well-stocked cellars of drink. And there, upon a barrel of malt whisky, sat a small and most sagacious-looking rat with a full glass clasped in his paw and a red hat upon his head. That must be Raticus, the druid's rat, said Rover, and he lost no time in retrieving the highly relaxed animal. Poor little thing, I'll put him in my pocket, said Lucy. Give me that red hat, said the Gruagach. It is the bonnet of rapidity. We are saved. He put it on his head. It fit all sizes. And holding Rover by the collar and his daughter by the hand, he called, Here's off! to outside MacNab's cave. Instantly, they were standing beyond the wheels and the deadly blades where the battle still was lumbering on. As they arrived, Rory Moore displayed for the first time some signs of irritation. Perhaps MacNab had made a disparaging remark about the socks Fiona had made for him. At any rate, he made a Lagrange feint. He made an O'Shaughnessy parry. He made a McGregor thrust. And he didn't make MacNab feel that well either, for he took the ogre's ugly head from between his two shoulders. Oh. Now, just inside MacNab's cave, there was a vat of cure. And after bathing his wounds with the balm it contained, Rory Moore was soon as well as ever he was. And they all joined hands together then. Here's off to Ochendini, roared the Grugach Goira. There they were, 
in Ochindini's billiard room. Lucy. Ha. Huh. Lovely to see you. <laughs> Care for some tea? Would you marry me? I love to, John, said Lucy. She was fond of tea. No time for that. Bring it, white goat, said Rover. The goat was brought and they all held on together. Here's off to the wise woman of Morningside, said the Gruger. There they were. In the wise woman's drawing room. Oh, fabulous! You've got the white goat, but don't bring it in here. Put it in the goat house. No time for that, madam. Bring in the golden bird. The golden bird was brought, and they all held on together. Here's off to the bag of nails tavern, said the Gruger. There they stood at the bar of the Bag of Nails Tavern, where the druid was just having a social dram with his cronies. Out leapt Raticus from Lucy's pocket. My God, said Ochendini. I got lost, said Raticus. So you did, said the druid. Give me the red bonnet now, Grogach. There's a good fella. The druid put it on his head, and they all held on together. Here's off to Offy Draft Keep, said the druid. There they were, in the beautiful hall of Offy Draft, where Fiona was sitting, knitting by the fire, and and they put the Grugach behind Fiona. They put Rory Moore right in front of her. Put down your knitting for a moment, dear, said Renardina. And the Grugach let a laugh out of him you could have heard in Timbuktu. I think they heard it in America, but I'm not sure about that. At all events, Fiona looked at Rory Moore, and her beautiful eyes filled with love. Her bosom heaved. Her lips Parted, and she said, Oh, Rory, it's been so boring not being able to talk, but now I can again. It'll be simply terrific. Where am I? We have pink candle wick bedspreads. <laughs> I rather care for some dove grey curtains and either taffeta or boucle crepe de chine. <laughs> and matching cushion covers and lozenge suede for the day rooms. Oh, remind me, I must knit a woolly cover for the toilet seat. <laughs> you know, I'll be getting Granny's spode china. And do you like those little plaster ducks you can pin on the wall? Rory blanched. Renardina giggled, and she turned a wooden dish into a priest, and a wooden ladle into a scholar of letters. And as quick as that scholar could write the names, Rory Moore and Fiona, vroom, the priest had them married. And how Rory Moore fared in marriage, wow, that's another story. But Renardina turned to the golden bird, and opening the door of his cage, she lifted him out and set him upon the floor. With a pass of her hand, she changed that bird to a tall, handsome man in evening dress with monocle, top hat, and bemused expression. Renardina? Fiona? Who are these people? Why are we here? Oh, Freddy, said Renardina, this is the day of our wedding. How could you possibly forget? But of course I have not forgotten, darling said Freddy, gallantly sweeping her into his arms. Vroom! Quick as a flash, the priest had them married. Then that priest married Lucy Goyle and the Laird of Ochendini. Cravens! I wonder who's paying for all this, thought the Laird of Offy Draft. And well, he might wonder, for the hooli and the drinking party they had next was a spree to remember. Folks came from as far away as Ochtar Machti. I was there myself, playing the harp for them. And the presence I was given was butter on a red hot coal, soup in a basket, and a grand paper cloak to keep me from the rain. The very cloak the seven Jimmies stole from me as I was coming home. Still, the wedding lasted nine days and nine nights. And if the last night was not better than the first, then the soles of my shoes are made of buttermilk, and I've walked from here to the moon and back on them. <laughs> <laughs>